Okay, hello everyone. Let's get started on the history system. So the first thing that we need to understand about history states, like I said in the last video, is this will allow us to go back and view previous states in the visual novel that we've already seen. It'll capture all of the dialogue on screen, the configurations, it'll capture the characters, all of their positions and their, their expressions, and what they look like, their color, their font, everything. Anything visualized on the screen is going to be captured in a history state because it needs to be saved and it needs to be reapplied to the screen if ever we go back to look at that particular history state. I gave the analogy, it's like a snapshot at any point in time in our visual novel, and it's created any time the character clicks to go to a new line. So to manage these states, we're going to have to create a some sort of data container. So let's start by making a new folder, and we'll call this history. This will have all of our history scripts. Inside of here, I'm going to create a new C-sharp script called a history state. And the history state is not going to do anything by itself without the data that it will capture. So we're going to create a new folder for the data containers. We need four data containers for the basic operation of a history state. The first one is going to be dialog data. The second one is going to be character data. Since we also want to save audio, we'll create a new script and make this audio data. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new C Sharp script for the graphic data. Now these are the different types of things that we will be saving inside of our history system. So if there are any other items or any other things that you create that are outside of the scope of these two or these four things, then you would want to make a new data container for that. Such as we will eventually create multiple text architects and we'll want to save which text architect is active and what is displayed on it. So we might make an additional data container for the text architects. So that would be text architect data. And likewise, we could also do one for history objects. And history objects could be something that any object in your scene can have attached to it, and that will make any object savable. That'll be something that we'll do later on. So we would make a separate data container for that. So just remember that for that, anything you want to be saved must be in a data container, and it must be linked to the history state. So how do we link these to the history state? Let's go ahead and open up that script. It's simple. First of all, let's make a new namespace to organize all of this. We're going to make this into a history namespace. And I'm going to remove mono behavior because this doesn't need to be on any object. It will exist in memory only. But what we do want is some way to write a history state to file. Because eventually, when we get to save our game files, we may want to save the list of history states, so even when we save our game and continue off later, we'll still have the log of what all has happened, and we can still go back and look at things even after we're reloading at a later time. So we want to do that by making this whole class serializable. So inside of these brackets, we'll say system.serializable, and this class can now serialize its variables and everything in it, and it can be written to file. Now let's link those data containers. I'm going to go ahead and close out all these scripts because I've got way too many open. Inside of Unity, let's open up all of these. And just like we did for the history state, we need to make sure that each one of these is inside of the history namespace and it is also serializable so that way it can be written to file when the history state is written to file. So we'll remove mono behavior. We'll take this move to namespace of history and then we'll make sure that this is system dot, system dot serializable. And we'll just remove start and update because we don't need that. When we're done, all of our items should be in the history namespace and they should all be serializable. It's important if we do not make them all serializable, then we will not have all of our data written to file when it comes to save these things. Okay, so let's go ahead and say what we need. First thing we need is we need some dialogue data. 
we need to record what's on the screen. So we're just going to call that dialogue. Next thing, we want some data to be saved for every single character that is on screen. So we'll go ahead and make a public list, and we'll fill that list with character data containers. And we'll call this characters. Then we're also going to want audio data. Now, since we have multiple audio channels that can be running, such as for ambience and for music, we're going to want multiples of these for every channel that we may have active. So we'll have a public list of our audio data. And we'll just call this audio. And the same thing for our graphics. Once we've got all four of those down, all we need is a way to reload these things onto the screen. And that's going to be through a public void called load. When we have a reference to a history state, if we call load on that state, then we will reach out to each one of these data containers that we've stored, and we're going to reload all of them. We don't have any of that set up yet, and we're not going to do that just yet, what we're going to do first is we're going to make a way to capture all of the data into these containers. That way we can save them into our history state and have a complete snapshot of what we're working with. So let's start with our dialogue. What are some things that we're going to want to record? On our screen, we're going to have the current dialogue, of course, so we definitely want a reference for that. And then who is speaking? Who's giving this dialogue? Maybe it's no one, maybe it's a character, so we want to record their name. And then each of our characters in their configuration asset, they have customizations that can be applied to their text, which include the font they use, the color, and the scale of their text. So we want that. We want our dialogue font, dialogue color, and dialogue scale. Now, you'll notice we have color for our dialogue color, but we have a string for our font, whereas the font is actually a TMP font asset. Again, the reason is just like for our sprites, we can't save the font itself because the font is not serializable, so we store instead a path to that, or just the name of the font, really. However, color is a serializable variable, so that is something that we can save just as it is inside of our dialogue data and our history state but our font needs to be saved and loaded by name. Okay, so we've got our dialogue, so that means we need the same thing for our name, right? So, just like for our dialogue, we get the speaker font, speaker color, and the speaker name scale. Which should be called speaker scale, just to stay in line with all the other ones. Now, let's make a function which can capture all of the data on screen. We won't have a reference to the actual data container for this. Instead, we'll run it straight off of the class, and it'll pull everything that it needs from the scene. So we'll make this a public static, and we'll return the dialog data. And this is going to be called capture. Capture is going to look in the scene, and it's going to grab everything it needs for us. So first thing let's do is let's make a new dialog data container called data, and let's populate some stuff in it. Everything that we're going to capture is going to come from the dialog system. So our dialog system, we'll just go ahead and snag the instance. Since we're using the dialog system, we're also going to want to use the dialog namespace. And there are two things that we're going to be pulling this information from, the dialog text and the name text that are on screen. They will already have all of this information for us, so we'll just pull it straight from those items, but we'll need to cache them. So we will make our bar dialog text equal to ds.dialogcontainer.dialogtext. And our name text is going to equal the ds.dialogcontainer.namecontainer.nametext, but we actually don't have that. So I don't think I made that public. Let's go back in and change that. If we look at that variable, it's actually private because we didn't want anything to have access to it. But now since we're going to be accessing it directly through the history state, we need this to be publicly accessible. So if we use the standard getter and setter though, we're not going to have access to it in the inspector. So what we want to do instead is we want to declare this as a field that will be editable in the inspector, yet also only privately assignable. The way we can do this is using a getter and a private setter making sure that we change this variable to public. And then in front of serialize field, we'll just put field right there. In order for us to compile successfully, let's just go ahead and comment this out real quick and say return data. 
And then if we look at our dialogue system, we can see the name text is there. However, it's only privately assignable. So we still have public access to it, but we just have to reassign it in the editor. So let's look at the dialogue panel and grab the name container, the name text, and just drop that back in there. Now we can go ahead and say the name text is the name container, name text. So the stuff that we're going to grab is, let's start with our current dialogue. So data.currentDialog is going to equal the dialogue text dot text. We'll just grab what's on screen. Then the data.dialog font is going to equal, we're gonna look inside of the default directory for our fonts and then just grab whatever font is called the name of what's currently assigned. So we can look at the dialogue text dot font.name as what we're going to grab, but we want to make sure that it's looking, because we're going to load it back through resources, we want it to look inside of the resources directory, inside of that font directory. So let's grab our good old file paths hub and check. Do we have font? We don't. So let's go into file paths. And in front of graphics, I'm going to duplicate, but I'm going to change this to resources, font, and just change this to font. Because if we look inside of our resources folder, we do have the folder called font, oh, with an S. Yeah, I need to add that. So this has all of our fonts in it. So let's just make sure I specify that as fonts to get the exact name of the resources folder. That will allow me to go ahead and say file paths dot resources font plus the dialog text. And then we just grab the dialog color from the text as well as the font size. And we'll do the same thing for our name text. So data.currentSpeaker is going to equal our name text dot text. And before we go any further here, there's one little thing that we might want to change inside of our conversation manager to account for this new history state. Inside of our conversation manager, when we come down to the point where we show the speaker name in our dialog system, we're throwing in the speaker data dot display name. And if that is narrator, let's go ahead and look at what that does. Show speaker data within our dialog system class, checks if it's narrator, and if it is, it makes sure that the panel is showing, but if not, it makes sure the panel is invisible. This will hide any kind of background for our speaker name. However, this would not actually change the text, and we would be stuck with pulling some invalid information, because although it's invisible, text is still assigned. So we want to make sure that if it is narrator, then we hide the speaker name, and we also say that the text is reset to nothing. So we'll go ahead and do this by saying dialog container dot name container dot name text dot text equals nothing. So that way, if we have narrator or something else, then we'll go ahead and hide it. And we're going to be grabbing the same information for the name text, so let's copy that from dialog and just change this to name for speaker font. So speaker font, and then speaker color, and speaker scale. And that's going to be just grabbing our name text instead of the dialog text. So we'll get all that information, and then we will return the data, and we have captured all of the dialog information on the screen. I'm going to create a testing script so we can visualize this. All I'm doing is making a public reference I can look at for this dialog data, and on every update, I'm capturing the data. So as I run this, we can see that the data has captured the dialog on screen, it's got all the settings, and knows Stella's speaking, and we can see it updating. So we see it update with Raylene, and we get the new settings. Let's do our audio data next, because this one will be pretty simple. This data is going to exist for every audio channel that we have, as every channel can run their own audio tracks. So the first thing we want is a reference to the channel that is actually running. By default, we'll have zero here. We'll want a public string for the track name. We will want a public string for the track path, which is the file and the directory where this is being run from. This will have to be added into our audio uh, manager, so that way we know the path of everything that we're running stuff from. If we look at our audio channel script, we've already got a file path that's being passed in, but we're not passing that into our audio track. So let's just make sure that we pass that in at the very end. So we'll have file path given in there, 
and that means we'll go to our audio track and we'll just create a new space for that. So public string path is going to have a getter and a private setter. And then when we initialize the track, let's also add in a string for the file path. And so as we cache the name, path is going to equal the file path. Now let's go back to our audio channel. And let's just go up the path here. We can see we have one reference here, which is being called from our audio manager. So if we go straight there, our audio manager is also taking in a file path. I believe everything is passing it down and we just had to add it to the audio track, but let's just make sure. Let's look at the two references here and the database extension is sending the audio file path and the audio manager is also sending the file path. So looks like we've got the references we need in place which means anytime we call for a track to play, we're automatically going to pass in the path. Just for confirmation, looking at our database extension for the audio, when we play a track, we can see when we, we are indeed passing in a file path. So when we save audio data, we'll be saving that path as well. Now we'll also want the volume and the pitch. So public float track volume equals one, and public float track pitch. Lastly, we want to know if this is a looping track. So public bool loop. Now, since we're going to be creating this for every audio channel, let's make a constructor where we can just pass in the channel and populate the data automatically. So public audio data will take in an audio channel and that'll just be the channel. So we'll say this.channel equals channel.index, uh, which is going to be the channel index. And we just want to make sure that we actually have a track to save. So let's look. If channel.activeTrack equals null, then we're going to return and do nothing else. Otherwise, let's get the track. So var track, whatever's playing, is going to equal the channel.activeTrack. And let's get the track name now. Track name will equal track.name. Track path will equal track.path. Volume will equal the volume. Loop will equal the loop. And I was given Visual Studio a shot to finish it, but let's go ahead and say track pitch equals the track.pitch. Oh, yeah, that's why I didn't finish it. We don't have pitch defined. Let's go ahead and do that. If we go back to our audio track, we have volume here. So we've got volume and we have a volume cap. Volume cap is actually what we need to pass in. Uh, but we'll go back to that. Public float, let's make pitch. So pitch is going to be, will be a reference to our pitch. So if we get it, then we will return source.pitch. And if we set it, then source.pitch equals value. And now we have track pitch saved. So our track volume actually needs to equal the volume cap. Volume cap is just the maximum volume that the track can be played at. Volume could be anywhere in between, such as if we're fading, we don't want to capture what it's currently at, we want to capture what its target is, and that's the volume cap. So we get that. And that's good for our constructor. Now let's build that capture function. So public static and since we're not just capturing one, we're capturing a list of all the channels, we'll make this a list of audio data, and we'll call it capture. What this is going to do is we're going to create a new list of audio data, and we'll call this audio channels. And then let's go through each channel in our audio manager. So for each bar channel in audio manager dot instance dot channels. We'll go through every one of these and say audio data data equals new audio data and pass in the channel. But let's remember that channel is a dictionary. It has a key lookup which is the channel number and then the audio channel is the value so we need to specify value here to get the actual channel. And then let's just say audio channels dot add data and when we're done, return audio channels. 
and we can add this to our testing as a new list and just capture it as we run. And as we run this, we can see that we get one element, which is the only active track. The song played is Electric Drift. The path is Audio Music, Electric Drift. We have the volume cap, the pitch, and it is set to loop. Let's see this captured too by adding a new song, or Ambience, which will be, we'll make it play Ambience. And I'm going to play Rainy Mood at volume 0.5. And there we go, we can hear the ambience rolling, it is at channel 0, rainy mood, and we've also got electric drift. So, so far it's capturing everything. Now let's do the graphic data. So, as far as what we're capturing here, we need to capture the graphics on every single panel. So for each one of these entries, we need a public string for the panel name, as well as a list of all the layers and the data that they should contain, because as we know, the graphic panels, whether that be background, cinematic, foreground, or whatever, they can all have multiple layers to them with different images to create some depth. So let's define a new data structure for them. We'll do system.serializable. So system.serializable, this is going to be a public class, and we will call this layer data. Inside the layer data, we want a public integer for the depth. This is how they are sorted, and we want a public string for the graphic name and a public string for the graphic path. We also want to know if it's a video or not. So public bool is video and if it's a video does it use audio? Public bool use audio. And now let's make a constructor where we can pass in each layer of the graphic panels to create some layer data. So public layer data, and we're going to take in a graphic layer called layer. From this layer, we're going to extract our depth. So that'll be the layer.depth. And let's see if it actually has a graphic on it. So if layer dot current graphic equals null, then we are going to do nothing and we're just going to return. If not, let's grab the graphic. So graphic equals layer dot current graphic and we can grab everything we need from it, including our graphic name. So graphic name is going to equal the graphic. Boy, I'm making up some good words here, aren't I? So graphic dot graphic name. Okay, for some reason I cannot spell graphic. So pardon me while I edit and cut. So we get our graphic name and we'll get our graphic path as the graphic graphic path. Again, when we're creating graphic objects, we're already passing this in. So it'll be populated for us already. And then if it's video, we're going to grab that and it, we're going to check if it uses audio. So it'll equal graphic, hey, I almost got it dot audio. Now, the only reference for audio we have is the audio source. So let's also add one to check if we're using audio. So let's check this out real quick. Whenever we create our graphic object and we make a video, then if we are not using audio, we're muting it. Use audio is not stored as a variable inside the graphic, it's just passed in as a parameter. So what we want to look for is see if our audio is muted or not. So let's come back up here and make a new public boolean called use audio. And this is going to equal true if we meet the criteria. So let's check if audio is not equal to null. If it's not, then let's see if it's not muted. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and return false because we are not going to use audio if it's not a video or if it's muted. And so for our history state, we'll say use audio is equal to graphic use audio. Now, let's capture the data. So public static, remember that we have to make this into a list, and we will take the graphic data, and we're going to call this capture. So what capture will do is we'll make a new list of all this data, and we'll call this graphic panels. It'll equal a new list. 
So we need to go through each one of these graphics inside of our graphic panel and pull out all the layers. So for each var panel in graphic panel manager dot instance, and we should be able to get all of the panels, but we don't have anything set up for that yet. So let's go into our panel manager. We see all panels is set up here. Now, just like we did for our name text, I still want this to be publicly assignable inside of the inspector because we have to link the objects, but I don't want anything else being able to set it. So we'll make ourselves uh, a getter and a setter. So get private set. Just make sure this is changed to public and make sure that serialized field has the field prepended to it. So now if we look at our graphic panel inside of Unity, because we've changed it, it's now empty again. So we just need to reassign these panels. So let's make sure that we call the first one background. And the third one is going to be cinematic. And the fourth one, or third one, I can't count. It's going to be uh, foreground. So we've got that in place. And now let's just go to our render groups and make sure that we grab our, from our layers. Let's go ahead and pull the background, link it to our background panel. Cinematic, link it to a cinematic, and foreground, link it to the foreground. So like magic, we have access to all of our panels. Now, what we need to do is we need to see if there's a graphic that is on this panel on any layer. So let's go ahead and check if the panel is clear of any graphics. But I don't think we have a way to do that just yet. So let's go ahead and jump inside of our graphic panels. If you don't want to go find it, just type in graphic panel and then control click, and it'll take us right to it. So we can get the layer, we can create the layer, and we can clear it, but we can't see if it's cleared. So let's make a Boolean. Let's come up here, public Boolean is clear, and set that equal to this. We wanna check a couple things to make sure if it's null. Let's see if our layers list is null. If it is, we know we got nothing in there, or layers.count is zero. And we could also have layers that have been created, but then have been cleared out and just by having their current graphic set to null. So the count wouldn't necessarily be zero and the list wouldn't be null. So we need to make sure that all of our layers are empty. And that would be the third condition to see if they are cleared. So, or let's grab all of our layers. So layers.all and let's get each layer as layer and pass it in for this expression where we check if layer.currentGraphic equals null. As long as that's the case for all of our layers, or we have no layers, or we have no list, that shouldn't really be the case, but I'm putting that in for precautions, then we know we are clear. So what happens if we're clear? If panel.isClear, then we just continue on to the next panel because there's nothing to save here. However, if we do and we have something, then let's go ahead and get the data. So we will make a new uh, graphic data instance called data. And what we're going to do for it is we're going to go ahead and grab the panel name. So data.panelName equals panel.panelName. And then we need to assign all of the layers. So all we have is the panel name here, but we need to capture all of the layer data for each of the layers. So public list layer data, and we'll call this layers. And we're just going to go ahead and say that data.layers equals new list of layer data. So now we need to go through each of the layers and go ahead and grab the information from them. So for each var layer in panel, dot layers which doesn't exist all we can do is grab the layers so let's go to our panel real quick so i'm just going to go ahead and say uh, graphic panel because i don't feel like navigating to it control click and here we are so we do have a list of our layers but it's private and real easy fix we'll just make this public but we'll proceed the assignment by get private set So as we're going back and changing these things to public, this should let you know that this is part of a make things private by default, and as you need access to them later, make them public. But 
restrict the access. This is just good uh, code restriction. You don't want too many things having access to too many variables, and you don't want everything being able to edit them. So, so when you create variables, create them in that mindset. Private by default and public by necessity. Okay, so we get all of our layers. And now let's make a new one. So layer data entry equals new layer data and we're going to pass in our layer so it can rip all of the data. Then data.layers.addEntry. Once we come out of that loop, we'll say graphic data. And then once we're out of all of that, we're going to return the list of graphic panels. And I've just realized that I placed this uh, capture function inside of the layer data class. That's not going to work. It needs to be outside of that and inside of the graphic data class. And inside of history testing, now we're grabbing the list of data and we are capturing the graphic data as well. And as we run this, we can see that we're capturing dialogue, audio, and now we've got the graphics. So in our background layer, we have the element for Village Night, which is at graphics background images, Village Night. It's not a video, it's not using audio, and it's at depth zero. So it's the very far back image. And as we transition, we can see not only did our music change, but we also had the background change. One thing I noticed, though, is as the background ambience went away, this channel did not go away. So I need to make sure that that gets cleared out in our audio data, so we only record the ones that are active. So we can do that right here when we capture it. So instead of checking if the active track is null here and returning before it assigns anything, we'll just assume that if we come to create it from this channel, that it has an active track. Or we can leave it in there for safe, safe precautions, just in case, but also add it right here. So we'll look at the channel. We will continue if the active track is not null, but why is this uh, out? So audio manager .instance .channels. If channel dot, what have we got? Channel dot value dot active track. So channel dot value dot active track. So we're looking in the dictionary of all the different tracks. So if we don't have an active track for the channel, we're not going to record it. And like that, now we have removed the inactive audio channel and we're only recording the music. So great, for our history state, let's go ahead and finish the last thing, which is going to be our character data. So where did I put it? This one is using a lot of scripts, uh, but character data is right over here. So. We've got nothing in here, so let's define what we need for each character. For every character, we want to know what their name is. And they can also have one name that identifies them, but a name that displays on screen, so we'll capture them both. Then characters can enter and exit scenes, so let's figure out if this one is enabled or not. Maybe if it's not enabled, we just won't record it at all. Next, we want the color of the character, since that can change. We also want the priority of the characters so we can sort them on screen and maintain that sorting priority. Then we want to make sure, is this character highlighted or are they darkened on the screen at this point in time? In addition to that, are they facing left or are they facing right? And here's an important one, how about the position? What spot is the character on in the screen when we recorded this? And then we're going to have a special string here called a J data JSON. And this will basically take all of the other data parameters that are unique for each different character type. So we could have different values in here for sprite characters and for live 2D characters and for model 3D and whatever other kinds you might have. These are the universal values that will be assigned for every character. And this will be unique to every character type. So they'll create their own entry here. But there's one more thing that we want, and that is the text detailing. Since we will be able to modify text detailing at runtime, such as the color of the font, the actual font being used, and the font size, if we so choose, we want to make sure that we cache the text detailing at this point in time so we can restore the text to its correct state for every character. So we can do that by grabbing the configuration of the character from their asset or the character configuration asset, 
But since we have to change the font out for a file path, we're going to create our own cache here. So let's make a new class, a system.serializable so it can be written to file. We'll make this a public class called character config cache. Inside of the cache, we're basically going to want the same things that our character configuration asset defines for the characters. So we want the name of the character and the alias. Alias isn't really important, so maybe we don't need that, but I'm basically just copying the values from the character configuration asset. The alias is small anyway, so it's not going to have a big footprint on our file size. Then we'll also want the character type. If we're using characters, we need to make sure that we use the character's namespace. So using characters. We also want the customization for the name color and the dialogue color. And then we want the font for both the name and the dialogue as well. This will be the path. And then we want the scale of the name and the dialogue. So once we have that, let's give ourselves a convenient way to clone this from a reference of our character. So we'll grab their configuration asset and then create a new cache based off of that. So public character config cache, where we are going to take in a character config data object, which is what our scriptable object uses. And we'll just call this our reference. Again, that data object or the reference is going to have all of this information in it. So we're going to snag it all. Well, we may not need to snag it all, such as the sprites list, but we'll snag everything that we need. So we know that we want the name, and that's going to equal the reference name. We want the alias, and then we want the character type. And now we'll also want the name color, as well as the dialogue color. And then we'll get our name font here, and that's going to equal the file paths dot uh, resources font plus the reference dot name font dot name let's do the same thing for our dialogue so dialogue font equals file paths dot resources font plus reference dot dialogue font dot name and then let's get the name font scale and the dialogue font scale as well. Visual Studio doesn't want to do that one for me. Uh, so that's fine. I'll do it myself. Reference dot name font, not name font, dialogue font. You had one job, Visual Studio. You had one job. Yeah, I'm not going to knock it. It does great. And that's basically all that we need here. So we can clone it and we're good. Okay, so... As we get our character data, let's make sure that we're outside of the character config cache here. Let's go ahead and define the capture function. So public static list of character data, and we'll call it capture. So capture is going to create a new list to character data. We'll call this characters, and we'll equal a new list. Okay. And so let's go ahead and loop through all of our characters. So for each var, we'll call each character character in character manager dot instance dot all characters. So as we loop through all of these characters, we're only going to record the ones that are visible. So if not character dot is visible, then continue. The reason we're not recording invisible characters is because they're not on the screen at that time and we don't want to waste file space with their details if they're not even being used at that moment. Um, so for any character that's not in this list, so let's say that we have three characters on screen and we've saved a history state right beforehand that only had two on screen. Only two characters will be inside of that history state. So when we go back to it, we only have information on the two. We don't have anything about the third. The history state doesn't even know the third exists. So basically what it'll do is it'll look and see, hey, these two exist, but that one doesn't. 
because it'll go back through the list of all the characters, it'll see the ones that are not recorded in the state, and it'll hide all the characters that are not recorded in the state. It'll do the same thing with audio, any tracks that are not playing, it'll cancel them out, any graphics that are not displaying, it'll hide those graphics, and it'll only show and only mess with the characters that are recorded in the state. This helps keep file size down, and it helps just keep processing down. So only the characters that are visible are the ones that we're going to mess with here. So if the character is not visible, we move on to the next, but if it is visible, then let's generate some data. So character data entry equals new character data. So what are we getting? Entry dot character name equals character dot name. And let's go get the display name too. Entry dot display name equals character dot display name. Entry dot enabled equals character dot is visible which maybe we don't need enabled, uh, but I'm going to pop it in there for right now. I may remove it later. But entry.color is equal to character.color. Entry.priority is going to equal character priority. Entry.is highlighted equals character.is highlighted. Oh, we don't have that, do we? Um, what do we have? Do we have dark? Do we have highlighted? So that's what it is. Highlighted. Okay, so character highlighted, and then entry dot um, position, position equals character, I don't think we have that defined. No, we just have set and we have move position. So let's hop to our character real quick and make sure that we also save their position in there. So once again, I'm going to say character, control click, and here we are. So let's define our position. Let's do this right down below priority. Um, I'm going to say public vector2, because this will be screen coordinates. We're going to call this, let's say if the character is moving to the position, they're not quite there yet. So this will be a target position. This will be where they are supposed to be, where they are, or where they're heading. So we'll get private set, and that's that. But when we come down to set the position or move the character, we need to log it. So we'll go ahead and say that uh, target position equals position in set position and move to position. Um, how about we go ahead and set that here as well? So target position equals position. I believe those are the only references that we need. Looks like it. Those are the only two. Okay. There we go. So entry.position will equal character.targetPosition. That's where they're going. And we also made this character config cache. So we need to cache their configuration information. So we'll say public character config cache will be the character config, which is really the text detailing. Um, so we want to make sure we save that as well. So entry.characterConfig equals character. Oh no, we need to generate one. So we need to generate a new character config cache. So a new character config cache, but we need to take in the reference of our character dot config. So we'll clone it and then we have that recorded. So that's all the data that's universal to the characters. Now let's get into the data for each different character type. So we'll make a switch statement and we'll look at the character dot config dot character type and evaluate what we're working with. So if the case is a sprite character or the case is a sprite sheet character, they are one and the same. So we'll go ahead and do something special for them. If the case is a live 2D character, then we'll do something for them. And if the case is a model 3D, then we'll do something for them as well. Again, if you're only using one of these types, maybe you don't even need to use a switch statement. Just log whatever information they need. So let's start with the sprite characters. First thing that we need to do is we need to generate something that can be converted into a JSON format. And a JSON format is basically, it's a, kind of a universal format. You get it in web pages, you, you get it in all sorts of different applications, and it's just a standardized format that contains keys and values, kind of like a dictionary in a way. Um, so we're going to make a class that can be converted into that. So we'll do one for each of these types. So let's start with 
make sure I'm outside in character data. I'm going to have system.serializable uh, public class sprite data. And inside of our sprite data, then I just want to record each layer of the sprite character since they can have they can potentially be multi-layered characters. So we will have once more system.serializable because everything has to be written public uh, class layer data. For for each sprite character, we're going to store a public list of this layer data. So some data for every one of the layers on this character. And what we're grabbing from each layer is a public string for the sprite name. This is the name that we made for each of our characters for their sprite mapping inside of the character configuration asset. That serializable dictionary, this is how we're going to save and look up their sprites so we can reload them when the time comes. Then we make public color color because each layer can potentially have their own colors set. All right, so that's the sprite data. Now let's go back up here. So sprite data, s data equals new sprite data. So as for what we do in here, we're going to go ahead and just populate that list of layers so that way we can assign all of the layers of the character to it. So s data dot layers equals new sprite data dot layer data a new list and we're going to go through each of them so we need to get our character as a sprite character right now it's just the generic character class so character sprite sprite character sc will equal our character as a character sprite and now let's go through every one of their layers so for each var layer in sc.layers then we want to do something we want to say var layer data equals new sprite data dot layer data and we're going to go ahead and grab the color so layer data dot color equals the layer dot renderer dot color the renderer is actively displaying the sprite on this character, so we just grab the color that's been assigned to it. And then layer data dot sprite name equals layer dot renderer dot sprite dot name. And we can add this to our layers now. So sdata.layers dot add layer data, and we have captured the information for every layer on our character. Now we just need to add it to our entry. So entry dot data JSON equals, we need to convert this class into a JSON string. We can do that easily by saying JSON utility, which is a class in Unity, to JSON. We're converting it to a JSON format. And what are we converting? The S data. So that will give us that data for the characters. Now, how about Live 2D? What does Live 2D need? Let's make a new class down here just for their data. System.serializable public class Live 2D data. And yes, I know we could probably split these into different classes, but you know, they're small enough. They And I've only got three, so I'm just gonna put them in here. They're not gonna be used anywhere else. I'm just gonna stick them right inside of this script. So if you have more, or if it bothers you, go ahead and make a separate script for each one of these different classes and just reference them here. But me, I don't particularly care, so I'm gonna stick them in here. Now we're gonna define two things that our live 2D characters will have. They have both expressions and they have motions, and these can be changed at will inside of the visual novel. So we want a public string for the current expression, and we want a public string for the current motion. So as we make a new live 2D character, let's go ahead and say that live 2D data L2 data equals new live 2D data. And now we just need to get our character as a live 2D character. So character live 2D, um, we'll call it LC. It'll equal our character as a live 2D character. So let's get our expression and our motion. But 
we all we've done is apply it to our live 2d characters we never actually went in and added that to any kind of persistent field so let's go to our character live 2d and just do that for a second underneath our other variables let's go ahead and make two fields here so we'll have a public string called active expression which is what's currently assigned to our character and we'll make it publicly retrievable privately assignable and we'll do the same thing for our active motion. Okay, so when we set motion, we'll say active motion equals animation name. And when we set expression, uh, we'll go ahead and make this either way. It can be an integer or it could be the actual name. So we will try the integer. So we'll say active expression uh, equals didn't mean to build there. No, I would not like to revert. Active expression equals expression index dot to string. But if we pass in the name, then active expression equals expression name. Okay, so L2 data, then we can now assign the expression in the motion. Expression equals R lc dot active expression and l2 data dot motion equals lc dot active motion then entry dot json equals json utility dot to json and we're going to convert our l2 data that's for our live 2d characters how about our model 3d let's go ahead and come down here and let's make a new class System dot serializable public class model 3D data. Let's say that maybe what we want to store in here for the 3D models, uh, let's get their position and their rotation as an example. So we will say public vector 3 position is one thing, public quaternion rotation is another. As we work on model 3D, we'll say model 3D data, m3 data equals model 3D data. And character model 3D, mc equals character as character model 3D. So m3 data dot position is going to equal the, the model character dot, let's get the, we need a reference to the model of the character, pop into the 3D model character and where is the model right here two private items for the model container and the model i'm going to separate these two and say public transform make sure that's capitalized public transform model get private set so the m3 data position will equal mc model dot position and m3 data dot rotation equals mc dot model dot rotation you get the picture enter in any of the data that you want to be saved into these areas if it gets to be too large maybe consider integrating a different script but this is pretty manageable right now if it gets any larger i would probably extract this but i'm going to leave it as it is because we're only taking a couple values for each thing uh, so what am i doing now uh, that's right, converting it to JSON. So entry.json equals JSON utility to JSON M3 data. Okay, cool. So, oh yes, and we need to return it. So we shall come all the way down to the bottom and just return the characters. So return characters. Did I, did I do that in the right spot? Nope. I didn't. Cut that, cut it out, and paste it in. And then we'll grab this information by making a new list in our testing script and going ahead and capturing the character data. Now, you can't have a full day of coding until you've run into an issue. And we now have a full day of coding. So character data is not populating for some reason. So let's go ahead and dive in and see why that might be. How about because I won the Darwin Award and didn't assign my character to the list? So let's take care of that. Characters.add entry. 
There we go. Now we should see it populate. And there we go. That's better. So now we have Stella and Raylene popping up in here. So I can see Stella has been set. Um, interestingly, her color is not replicated. Priority is zero. Is highlighted. Facing left is false. But if we look at Raylene, facing left is also false. We got the position. Their positions are being recorded. Uh, looks like the colors are... N oh, no, 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 no. That's not their text coloring. Okay, that's right. That's correct. Here, here's what I was looking for. Their text detailing. So we recorded all of that. And then look at this. This data JSON. So we've got the information in here. Let me go ahead and just copy that. So this is what we're looking at in the JSON data. It's got all of our layer information in it. And we can see that our first layer has a sprite name called one. It is using the color of just plain old white. And then the second one is sprite name happy. So that's on layer one. And then we've got just the color for that layer. So that's good. It's got everything that we need and we should be able to re, I don't wanna save that. And we should be able to reload it once we load a history state. But what this does is it shows us that we've got everything being recorded correctly for our characters, for our backgrounds, our audio, and the dialogue on screen. So this is basically what a history state looks like. So how about we come back to our history state? And let's go ahead and make a new constructor, or not a constructor, we'll just make a function which will go ahead and capture the current state here. So public uh, static history state and we will call it capture so the same thing that we did before we're going to make a new history state and then we're going to get all of this stuff in there so dialogue dialogue so state dot dialogue equals dialogue data dot capture state dot characters equals uh, character data dot capture state dot audio equals audio data dot capture and then state dot graphics equals our graphic data dot capture and then return state so we can go ahead and capture the current history state at any point right here and that's where we're going to stop this episode off so we're going to end it here with our history states being able to be created but not recalled. So next video, we'll establish the manager and start recalling our history states.